Um, good morning, everyone. Um, Trish Murphy is the project officer for the Inishon Rivers Trust in Donegal. And I, Liz Gabbett, am the project officer for the Meg Rivers Trust in Limerick. And we are going to share our experience about how we connect communities and other stakeholders who care for the rivers, streams, lakes and coastlines in our catchment. Next slide. Often when I go out to meet people for the first time, I have to explain what a rivers trust is. To build confidence and trust in what we do, it is really important that people know what a rivers trust is about. So the first thing is, we are a non-profit organisation that are started by local people who see the need to come together to care for local rivers, streams and lakes. And we are focused on looking for practical solutions and then working with all the stakeholders involved to implement those solutions. Some of the pictures you see here is the type of work that we engage with. So on the far left, what you can see is a citizen science day, how we teach local people how to identify the water insects or marker invertebrates that can indicate um, water quality um, levels. Then I've got a little picture of a crayfish and a lot of the work we do is promoting biosecurity um, actions that everyone needs to employ to protect, for example, the spread of crayfish plague that has decimated our native white claw fish around the country in parts. And we also collaborate with anglers who we have a shared objective with them and we want to protect the habitats of the rivers. And the big picture you see on the far right is taken from Inishon, where they're doing fantastic work and doing bank revetment works to prevent bank, river bank erosion. I think it's important for people to understand that the concept of rivers trusts like organisations originated more than 35 years ago when different communities and stakeholders came together to protect their shared resource of the local river and saw that to protect the river, you need to think of the whole catchment and everything and every community is interconnected. Back in 1984, the Ballandary River Enhancement Association started when angling organisations from all sides of the community came together to work alongside each other to restore their Ballandary River. The Ballandary River Enhancement Association would eventually become a Rivers Trust in 2012. Over in England, the first Rivers Trust was West Country Rivers Trust, and it became a recognised organisation in 1994, while our umbrella organisation, the Rivers Trust, was founded in 2004. Currently, there are over 60 Rivers Trusts on these two islands, and there are around 18 Rivers Trusts in all of Ireland. As I said before, all Rivers Trusts are independent organisations, but we have a common governance setup and the culture of sharing knowledge and collaboration that gives a new organisation a structure is something that can be built on and sustained. When anyone is looking to engage with communities and stakeholders, it is essential to be conscious of how you communicate and the language you use. The first thing to do is know your audience and get a sense of their objectives but keep an open mind that you will learn more about talking to the people and you learn more from the person as you talk with them. It's essential to be friendly and helpful um, to get people to engage with you. And listen, let people talk, listen to their experience. When I'm talking with farmers, I want to learn from them and their lived experience of living and working alongside a river. When talking with communities, you need to speak their language and use plain language principles. Remember, plain language isn't about dumbing down, it's about being inclusive. It simply means, means to remember your audience's background, avoid jargon, abbreviations that can often have multiple interpretations. Recently, I wrote an article about the importance of trees along riversides. I used the term riverside instead of riparian, because it's not in everyone's language. It's not that people don't know what a riparian zone is, it's just that they wouldn't necessarily use that word. Also the term NFM, that can be interpreted in a couple of different ways. No further message, not for me, or natural flood management. And then make your examples relatable. In the same newspaper article, I wanted to explain how the shade 
from trees over water is important to provide school um, cool spots for resting fish. If you never fished, this might not have occurred to you. But if you're a farmer, you would be well aware that the animals in the field on a hot day will seek shade. And it's the same principle that's for the fish. It's good to know that good communication principles, but connecting people is about developing relationships. You need to be brave and get out there. You need to be happy to ring strangers and have conversations with them on the phone. And then you need to follow up with the people that you've engaged with. And to build a trusting relationship, only make promises you can keep. And when you ask for help when you need it, and quite often the person that you want to engage with are the people that can give you the help. And when you're parting um, ways with a person on a, after a conversation, always reiterate we have a shared objective. We all need, want, and want clean water and a healthy environment. So we're all on the same team. So thank you for now. And I'm, I'm going to pass you over to my colleague, Trish Murphy up in Donegal. Thank you very much, Liz. So um, as Liz was saying there, um, developing relationships is very important for a trust. And there are different types of relationships that we would develop. So um, relationships with our agencies are very important. And they are basically built on a foundation of trust. As Liz was saying there, it's trust with everyone, but this is very important to set up with the agencies and can be a slow process. We need to understand each other's perspectives on things. And to, in particular for a community group, we need to understand the remit of each of those agencies. So um, <clears throat> these were questions, like um, back in 2017, um, the Inishon Rivers Trust were thinking about this issue, like what um, agencies did what, who should we ring in such a particular situation. So what we decided to do was to run an event called the Who's Who on Inishon Rivers. And to this event, we invited as many of the agencies as we um, could think of that had a remit on rivers. And we also invited to the general public. It turned out to be a really, really successful um, event um, because it helped us to understand what each of the agencies did, but it also helped the agencies to understand what we did and where we came from. And we got to meet each other face to face, which unfortunately is not something we've been able to do lately. So there's also our relationships with academics. So um, liaising with the university or, an, or um, an institute of technology is a great opportunity for trusts to innovate. Um, uh, when we do these um, joined up projects with them, we can have very good scientific outcomes from them. And also we produced really high quality reports that would be very useful across the board. Um, as well as that, um, we can also engage with placement students um, from the academic institutions and the Rivers Trust now have two placement students who have been um, great, have been doing great work with us. Um, so pivotally, our relationships with volunteers are really, really important. Um, these are the wonderful volunteers that engage with us um, on a daily basis. They are a very diverse range of people um, who have a lot of local knowledge, local knowledge about their rivers, about um, you know, what's happening on their rivers, about the problems that are on their rivers. And when we are working with these people side by side in the riverbanks, it's a great opportunity for us to learn more. And as Liz was saying, to build up those um, relationships. So we're learning together all the time. You can see in the photographs here that there's a range of things going on here where, um, you know, people in trusts are often termed uh, people with wet feet. So up on the right hand corner, we have uh, a group in the river. It's hard to keep them out of the river most of the time. Um, then we have down in the bottom right there, we have, um, you know, learning together, learning about um, different aspects of managing our rivers and the catchments. And then we have um, groups where we might be actually physically doing some very physical, practical work together. And people will engage and provide tools and machinery and get together and people are very giving with their time. Oh, whoops. So um, I suppose, um, you know, in terms of the roles of Rivers Trust um, and our approach, a solutions-based approach is really, really important. We tend to be action-led 
um, organizations. And um, we are in a great position because we are working at the local level within the community and we can gain a very good understanding of the problems at the local level. Um, this is, you know, when we're working on the riverbank with people, that's the time when we get to chat about the challenges and also to develop those solutions. So this is co-design and co-production in action, really. So um, as an example, we've, um, I have some pictures here of a project that we did with the Kuldaff um, River Angling Association back in 2018. So this project involved a range of stakeholders, um, the Wild Trout Trust, the Locks Agency, um, there was the local landowner himself and a range of volunteers. The landowner had a significant problem with bank erosion and you can see in the left hand photograph a lot of erosion there right from um, the top of that photograph all the way down and he was losing a significant amount of land as well as that there was a lot of sediment being passed into the stream. So with um, ha all hands on deck over a three day period equipment on the river and two years later the right hand photograph shows you how it has turned out. It has revegetated really well. The locks agency did some fencing and put in pasture pumps and the landowner is very very happy with what has happened. So collaborating is really really important. Another project that the Inishon Rivers Trust has been involved with um, and has involved a whole range of people in it so far was, is a, a natural flood management project. So back in early 2018, we ran an event to which um, Connor Galvin and Dan Turner, who spoke here yesterday, um, they were both helped out in facilitating an awareness evening amongst locals um, in Inishon. So this project then um, evolved into more awareness sessions, um, a relationship with um, Trinity College, where we produced a scoping project for NFM in Donegal. And then we've now moved on to an implementation phase where we are going to be installing some NFM features in the village of Clonmany in the northwest of Inishon. So this is a project that we called On the Ground because finally we're getting onto the ground with this project. So um, very importantly, it's about collaborating together and learning from each other, even within our own organisations. So what the MAIG and the Inishon Rivers Trust have done is that we have um, developed a network for Rivers Trusts around Ireland, and we call it the ICATCH network. This is um, funded by The Wheel and by LawPro, and these are the members that we have um, out of um, the organisations that are in uh, across Ireland at the moment. These are the ones that have signed up, but it's open to the other trusts all to sign up and so that we can learn together and we can collaborate on projects going forward. So finally, just to thank you all for your attention, the MAG and the Inishon Rivers Trust are supported by funding through LawPro, um, which is provided by the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage and managed by the Rivers Trust. This project is called the Resilience Pilot Project and I suppose it's the, the title is very um, apt because this is the project where we are going to explore ways that Rivers Trust can be more sustainable and that um, by learning and training together that we will ultimately have a greater impact on our environment. So um, on behalf of myself and Liz, thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you um, Liz and Trish for that really interesting, I think thought-provoking talk um, about how Rivers Trust connect communities and also connect with other stakeholders uh, in the catchment community. Uh, and thank you for keeping to time as well, uh, really appreciate that. Uh, I'm now delighted to welcome uh, Donald Sheehan from the Bride EIP project. Um, a farmer himself, uh, Donald's one of the main drivers and project leaders uh, for the Bribe project. So Donal, uh, if you have your uh, camera on and share your screen, uh, it's over to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can you see that, Mark? Yes, that's grand. Okay. If um, you start, start your slideshow uh, from the beginning at the top. Oh yeah. Very good. That, that's you now, okay. Yep. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mark, and thanks to Catherine and the organising committee for, for the invitation. Uh, it's always good to, to share the experience or, or the experience we've had to date, at least. So uh, the Bride Project, 
biodiversity regeneration in a daring environment and uh, it uh, I suppose it does exactly what it says in the tin or at least uh, it attempts to do that anyway it's trying to restore biodiversity in intensive farmland and even though it says it's a daring environment uh, a daring environment won't always be daring there's you know there's, there's all sorts of uh, and, and types of farmers here uh, so we, we have equine tillage suckers beef uh, sheep etc um, and this is the this is the area here. It, it stretches from uh, Tallow uh, in West Waterford, where, where the the bride flows into the Black Water. It's a, it's a tributary of the Black Water, all the way up to to Glenville in, in the west, at the foot of the the Nagel Mountains, where the river rises. And uh, it, it's open to all all the farmers uh, in between within that catchment area. So these these are our farms, and they're kind of spread. Um, throughout the catchment area and uh, they're less so I suppose on, on, on either of the of the peripheries and uh, I suppose that's just the, the difficulty we had in, in trying to get the message out there when we started off in 2018 uh, but ult ultimately what we'd love to do is, is to, to make sure that that's, that's all blue in, in, in another couple of years and that all farmers are singing off the same hymn sheet and if you go back to previous agri-environment schemes the problem was that uh, you, you could have one farmer uh, that would be in an agri-environment scheme, the next farmer could be five or six miles away, uh, that would be in the, uh, the same environment scheme and everyone in between uh, would be doing something different. And the whole thing about um, improving the environment, whether it is, uh, you know, whether it is rivers or, or on land, it, it's all, all farmers uh, kind of singing off that same environmental hymn sheet. So we, we have 42 farmers, 19 dairy, 14 beef, four equine, four tillage and one sheep. And, uh, you know, it, it's open to uh, all enterprises and, and, and no matter what your size of farm is, uh, we don't mind really. It's anyone that has land uh, can manage it for biodiversity. So there's a project manager and uh, Sinead, our, our project administrator, Sinead Hickey. And we also didn't uh, have a project ecologist uh, whenever we, we need it. So, um, it's it's kind of based really on the Green Deal, the farm to fork strategy, if you like. Um, it, it's trying to get at least ten percent of 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 any farm um, uh, for, uh, as an area for nature. Uh, and and the important word in that slide there is is minimum, uh, because what you're looking at there is uh, in in intensive farmland, and this could be anywhere uh, in the world even. You you've ninety percent that you use to produce food, and you have ten percent that's used to. Uh, uh, filter the water to draw down carbon uh, to improve the air quality. So you're talking about woodland, hedgerows, wetlands, bogs, etc. And it's 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 a paltry figure, uh, ten percent that that we're depending on that ten percent to counteract the damage we're doing in the other ninety where where farming isn't sustainable. Uh, so we we draw up a, a plan and uh, for each farm and we tailor it uh, to, to that specific farm and and, and to the specific farmer. Um, we, we engage with them and, uh, you know, we don't ask for measures that, that they don't want, uh, but, but there, there's about uh, 19 or 20 different measures altogether and, and there's always something there for, um, for all farmers. Um, so if you look at uh, the bottom there, uh, 8.35, that's the percent BMA in this farm. Uh, this is the Bride River uh, going along the, that curve there on the, the north side. Um, and that, that, that farmer has a lot of riparian buffer strip. So uh, it comes in at 2.44%. Uh, and, and we look for a management plan for that, that area, along with these hedgerows, these field margins. Uh, there's a, there's a, wet, a wetland down here, and there's a bit of woodland here. And uh, we, we try to, to get every farmer, we encourage every farmer to try and get up to 10%. Um, that, that's our kind of goal. So if you take, uh, this is very uh, typical of, of intensive farmland. All you see is, is, is just uh, green fields as it were. So I'm, I'm going to take you through uh, very quickly uh, uh, how we'd go about uh, increasing the biodiversity, not just the, the quantity, but the quality of the biodiversity on, on a farm. So, so that, that's, uh, there's three fields and that's about 60 acres. Um, and, and you know you, you wouldn't say there's a whole lot of biodiversity there. But the first thing is is um, uh, the, the the hedgerows, uh, and they're contributing uh, uh, four thousand five hundred and sixty square meters. And this is all adding to the BMA, what we call the biodiversity managed area. Um, so every every habitat has an area, and and we totaled that that uh, area up to try and get to ten percent. Uh, so, whoops.
So then you can add the field margins and we look for a two meter field margin around all of the hedgerows. Uh, and that comes to 6,076 square meters. And it's, it's a huge area. And yes, you are point, pinching uh, two meters uh, off, your, off, your, uh, field mar uh, off your field area. But it's kind of palatable to farmers, you know, it, it's, it's kind of pain, painless extraction. The hedge is there already and it is usually a bit scraggy uh, anyway. And, and we just ask them to pull the wire out or if it's a tillage farm, just to, to move out a small bit and leave, leave a field margin. Uh, and and it's, 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 um, it, it is difficult for them, but when it's done, uh, it kind of merges in with the hedge anyway and they, they, don't, uh, they don't mind it. Uh, so then down the bottom here, we have a tree line. So the, there was um, 80 trees put in there and that's contributing 415 square meters. Oops. Uh, so over here then on the left hand side, we put in some wild bird cover. Uh, it's what we call an annual biodiversity plot. So it's, it's a, a pollinator wildflower mix uh, that's, uh, that's in bloom in the summertime. And it's an absolute fantastic mix of, of flowers that are really suitable for pollinators. And in the winter time, uh, the seed heads come out and you, you have things like uh, linseed and, and phacelia and, and gold of pleasure and stuff uh, like that. Uh, for, for uh, wild bird cover in the winter time. And th that's taken out um, uh, 4,815 square meters. Maybe not for the faint hearted because um, you know, that's, that's about an acre gone there, uh, but we, we, we pay them for that, that acre. Uh, so the yellow area here, uh, this is definitely for the honors class, but it, it's, it's uh, when we talk about biodiversity, uh, the, the most of the, 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 the problematic species, we'll say, the, the species that are in decline are ground nesters. And if we're really serious about talking uh, about improving biodiversity, um, you need to, to cater for these species. And uh, Skylark or Hen Harrier or Snipe or Curlew, they're all ground nesters and they, they need an, an area that's, that's relatively free from disturbance. So there's a special management plan for uh, an area like this. You can still graze it. But it, it just needs to be tailored to suit the, uh, the breeding conditions of the, of the skylark or, or if it was a curlew in wetland or a lapwing or whatever. Uh, so then there was two ponds put in. This is a natural wet area and uh, there was just uh, a pond was excavated out here. Uh, and then there was another pond excavated here. These were natural wetlands anyway. Uh, that had 200 square meters. Uh, over here, there was a, a, a tree line. And in be the, the whole tree line was fenced off because there was a narrow area between the trees. And this is kind of just using your head a small bit. It, it was never going to be a, a, of much use to, to uh, you couldn't get machinery in there. So it was just fenced off and it, it, it added a thousand square meters of rough grassland, which is uh, really suitable for barn owls and kestrels and so on. Uh, so then down here in the bottom corner, there was a quarry. Um, and that can be left there as rough grassland, but in this case, the farmer looked to put in some woodland because there's, as you can see, there's very little woodland. And that contributed 320 square meters and there's about 150 oak trees gone in there. And now you have, from a standing start, uh, you've over eight different uh, habitats uh, and you still have an awful lot of your, your, your land left for, um, for grazing. So then down in the bottom corner, there was a wet area and the farmer just fenced it off uh, again, it, uh, it needs to be grazed, and this is important, that all habitats need management. And, you know, saying that, uh, you know, you just leave it off and rewild it, uh, that's not really uh, a good idea in this instance, at least, because um, it, it, a lot of the species that are, that are in the climate, the ground nesting species, they, they do actually need uh, a specific structure uh, to breed in. And, and that structure is only got by, by grazing animals, but it's just that we, we've, we've put too many animals in there. Um, so uh, this, the, so the red area was was carved out as well, uh, and that's got that's wet grassland, and that's that contributed uh, five thousand square meters, uh, giving a total figure of uh, twenty nine thousand over twenty nine thousand square meters, which is two point nine four hectares. And you must remember that this red area here and this yellow area, uh, they, they still need to be grazed. So so you're you're, you're not losing a whole lot, uh, and it brings you up to twelve percent uh, BMA. Um, so then you can add to the quality of it. You can see the little uh, bee icons there. The, we put in bee scrapes and, and a lot of the, the south facing banks. So it's, it's really just um, creating a, a, a sheer uh, face on, on a south facing hedgerow, uh, two meters by two meters. Uh, and that's, that's a habitat for, for solitary and wild bees. 
Um, and that just adds to the quality of it. And also, two little patches, uh, again, maybe for uh, not for the faint hearted, if you're that way inclined, but nettle patches, uh, nettles are, are the, the food plant for about five different species of caterpillars. So if you haven't got uh, nettles, uh, and out in the middle of the field is where we recommend them. Uh, you won't have those five caterpillars, you won't have those five species of butterflies. Uh, so all in all, from a standing start, you can really, uh, you know, make huge improvements oh, yeah. to biodiversity. Uh, so th this is um, this is a riparian buffer strip. So when we take out all of those habitats, we, we score them for quality. So if you look at this uh, uh, buffer strip here, or, or uh, riverside strip, as Liz mentioned, um, you can see the the it's not protected um, and and there, there actually isn't any any buffer strip. So if you take our scorecard, uh, it, we look for a three meter buffer strip and that gives you ninety, 90 uh, that's over ninety percent of the area and that will give you seventy marks free from disturbance uh, another twenty and you go down to disturbance. If there's livestock access there, you don't have a a, a riparian margin. Uh, so that's an auto fail. If there's farmyard runoff, it's an auto fail. Pesticide application, fertilizer application, and you might say that's severe with all those auto fails, but it's not really because you know you're talking about water. You're talking about water for human consumption, and it's just uh, you know that's just an auto fail. You know if, if there's pesticides of, or, or runoff or sorry or, or whatever going on uh, on the side of a river that's used for human consumption, it's just auto fail. Uh, cover invasive species, you might say that's very low, but on, until all farmers are, are, are kind of in some sort of a, uh, have some sort of a management plan whereby they're, they're working to reduce invasive species, um, there's no point in penalizing our own farmers, so, uh, but that can be changed. Finally, um, this is, a, this is a, a, a page from 1980, 1983 Leaving Chemistry book, my, my, my daughter was looking at it the other day, uh, and would you believe it? It's it's all the same. It, it could be it could be today, and and the point I want want to make is you know we're, progress is slow, and we we I suppose we take it for granted in this country. We have so much rain, uh, and we have so many water bodies. Uh, maybe we take it for granted, but but it still talks back in 1983 about effluent uh, fertilizers getting into the river. Pig and poultry story, and and funny enough, uh, they didn't say cattle story because cattle story wasn't an issue at the time because slatted units were only just coming in. Uh, soilage influ uh, effluent, thankfully, is is gone, but but it's it's the same old story. Uh, so uh, it, it's thanks to uh, conferences like this where we're raising awareness and and I suppose putting a bit of pressure. Uh, but ultimately, I would love to see more engagement uh, with farmers at farm level, no finger pointing, uh, just uh, raising awareness and and showcasing what improvements can be made. So uh, thanks very much, uh, Catherine. Um, thanks for that. Okay, um, Donald, thank you very much for that. that. That was a fascinating insight into the Bride project and I'm sure it will provoke uh, a lot of questions. So thank you very much. Um, next, I would like to welcome uh, Carol Quish, who uh, amongst her many talents uh, that you can read uh, in, in the um, abstract booklet is also the project manager for the Mulcare EIP. So Carol, uh, if you have your screen shared and your microphone on, uh, I'll hand over to you uh, and I'll let you know your slides are visible. Yeah, that's grand. We can see them. Wonderful. Thank you. Over to you, Carol. Good morning. Thank you, Matt. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the invitation for this conference today. I am presenting on behalf of the Mulcair EIP project. And my name is Carol Quish, as Mark just said, and I'm the project manager. And I'm presenting from a lovely uh, spring morning from the heart of the Mulcair catchment. So just to give you a brief overview of my presentation today, I'm initially going to talk about the, the give you a little bit of background on where the Mulcair catchment is, then some information on the project that I am project manager for, and then I'm going to give us a report on our findings to date. However, before I start uh, my presentation properly, uh, I was thinking about uh, what re-imaging means uh, when I was asked to, to present and whatever. So I went off and did some little bit of research on what exactly is re-imaging. Is it re-imaging or re-imaging? Uh, this is what came up in one of my searches. So re-imaging applies of lack of actual imagination, which I don't 
completely agree with. So if you give anybody uh, some cranes and some black paper to express uh, to express your imagination, so therefore to re um, they will use it. So it is therefore to reinterpret something imaginative, imaginatively. And actually, that's a nice uh, bit of philosophy for today. So it's to reinterpret it something imaginatively. So moving along to get my philosophy, we'll concentrate on the Mulcair catchment. The Mulcair River drains, uh, rises into the Speed Fellow Mountains in North Tipperary and drains through a farm landscape before joining the Shannon River near Anacotti River village. The catchment drains an area approximately of 650 kilometers square in County Limerick and Tipperary. It has several major tributaries, including the Dead, the Caheen, the Bilbo and Newport. Just to clarify, I refer to the water body as the Clear River uh, as the main stem, which is just south of Palace Green um, Village, and that is approximately 21 kilometres in length. Arterial drainage has been carried out on numerous occasions in the catchment as far back as 1878. It is unique in some that in some of the main drains that, that uh, leave the farms do not enter the Mulcair property for approximately seven miles in some locations. Uh, Channel was built in 2001 to bypass Capamore village because this village had been flooding for years and this eliminated that problem. Also within our catchment we have um, several areas of SAC and the Upper Board Clare uh, Steve Fellum has an SPA delegation designation as well as special protected area in the Upperlands. So the Mulcair EIP, uh, it has funding of 1.175 million. It's a five-year project, and it was co and it is co-funded by the Department of Agriculture and the EU. The project office is located in Palace Green. Uh, there were initial problems getting this project off the ground and with two project managers appointed in 2019 and then I was appointed in January of 2020, having previously been the part-time administrator for the project. So I've been with the project from the outset, albeit in different roles. And uh, we have a board in the Mulcair consisting of three members and the chairman of our board is John Dillon, who's the former IFA president president who farms within our multi catchment. We also have a steering and advisory panel who come with a vast array of both practical, commercial and research skill sets. And there is an operation group. Meetings are ongoing with all these groups and their advice is available 24 seven to me and the rest of the team. Uh, we recently launched uh, an, an information booklet for our project, which can be viewed on our website, uh, mulcair.com, uh, uh, for more information on the project. And my contact details are also on the first slide. So I am going to give a quick report. On, um, uh, on, um, so sorry. So uh, we are managing within our Mulcair catchment seven priority action areas. These are areas that have been delegated as having moderate to good water quality, and we are looking after seven of them, uh, which are the Inch, the Dead, Carty, Two, Capoy. Mulcair 10 and Mulcair 20. Now, apologies about the map, but to get them all on one screen, this is the best I can do. Now, currently the Todd Water River Cycle Review is being undertaken, and some of the existing priority action areas are going to be expanded. And there is also the addition of four uh, areas for action going to be included, which is the Cahar and Nahalla, the Dune, Kalina Garof, and Mulcair 50, uh, which will further extend our, our work in the area. So the soil types within our Mulcair catchment. Soils range in the catchment from heavy clay soils in the lower reaches to peat soils in the uplands. In actual fact, there is an area north of Palace Green called the Mesh, and it did not get its name for nothing. It is a floodplain for the Mulcair. The stocking density within the catchment ranges from a roughly approximately 1.5 to 2 livestock units per hectare, which is low compared to the national average. We have land of all soil index types in the catchment and also within individual farms because of the topography of this catchment. So our water quality of the catchment. All reports from EPA and the desktop studies from the lo local catchment assessment and LAPRO 
in the priority action areas have identified agriculture as a significant pressure with overland flow of nutrients, especially phosphorus uh, and silt as the main issue affecting the quality of the water with, throughout the catchment. So the objectives of our project is to, we are planning to work with 60 farmers in the seven priority action areas. And there is also a community and outreach element to our project, which will concentrate on the local national schools and community groups within the catchment. And I recently submitted an application for funding to the Community Water Development uh, Funding 21 uh, source for approximately 60,000 for three projects, uh, for three different communities within the, the catchment. The outreach program has been invaluable in creating mechanisms with the farming community in the Mulcair catchment. COVID has hindered a lot of this work, but as soon as our restrictions are lifted, we hope to be back on the ground again. So some of my findings to date. This is a graph of the proportion of farmers within the different farm enterprises we are reporting on. Uh, as you can clearly see, the suckler and dairy make up over 66-67% of the number of farmers we have. But interestingly, we have five organic farmers who have, who have signed up for the project, but they are all in the non-dairy enterprises. But we have a good dispersal of different farm types. So one of the issues that was very important to us uh, when we started out our project was the whole concept of sustainability within Irish agriculture. And there is a universal agreement on the, diverse, on the desirability of the concept of sustainable agriculture, but there are different ways on how that is interpreted. There is general agreement that sustainability should be considered under three pillars, social, environmental, and economic. So to add to this uh, idea of sustainable farming, Chagas have come up with this model uh, uh, to succinctly define sustainable agriculture as an approach that we can sustain into the foreseeable future. This project focuses on seven dimensions of, that, of sustainability, resource use efficiency or water quality, which is our area of interest, biodiversity, economic sustainability, gaseous emissions, animal welfare and health and safety. These sustainable values or sustainable variables are not mutually exclusive. For example, if we take a farmer who uses low emission slurry technology, he can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and also reduce the impacts of water quality on his farm. So they're not mutually exclusive and there's, it's a core benefit for many situations if this uh, idea is followed. So in light of this uh, sustainability approach to farming uh, and taking best practices into consideration, the Mulcair EIP has developed a suite of mitigation measures for our farmers from farmyard and roadway runoff to habitat retention within the catchment. And the images on the right hand side here are our actual farmers participating in our mitigation measures. So just to, as I said, I have approximately eight or nine different eight categories of mitigation measures for the project. But just looking at the uptake so far, the highest uptake has been, uh, these are the measures that are chosen obviously by farmers, is family roadways and um, nutrient management. However, one of the lowest uh, mitigation measures to be implemented is riparian buffers at 7%. It's here on the, on the left hand side in the buff colour. This is disappointing and hopefully that we will see this increase over the, the life of the project. Uh, again, nutrient management plans and farm road measures are following a trend that would be expected in the current climate uh, for, uh, because they come under cross compliance SMRs, uh, sorry, statutory man, uh, management requirements on farms. So this is what the farmers within the catchment and all our Ireland, Ireland will have to complete uh, over the next number of years anyway. But these are the intermediate findings for our project. And as our project is rolled out across the, the catchment, I would hope to see changes in this. And we would be very cognizant of the farmers in the different categories at the moment. And we would be trying to promote the ones that we're not seeing uptake on when we're dealing with the farmers on the ground. So to summarize, farmers are generally concerned and wanting to do the right thing. 
in, it is overwhelming within the catchment. Every day I go out onto farms, it is overwhelming. They all want to do the right thing. And what we have planned are farm discussion groups, which are a very important element of this project. And each farmer uh, would have to attend five of these per year, and it's a mandatory requirement for our participating farmers. The other, some, the other overwhelming success of this program has been the partnership arrangement, not just between the farmers and the multi-care team, but also between, uh, also between, with our external partners who are involved with the MIP, such as LAPRO, ASAP, Chagas, the local authorities, the list goes on, but they're at the end of a phone call to us at any stage to give us advice and always, always willing to help us in every way. The theory of one size fits all in agri-environmental or pillar two schemes, as they're more commonly known, is in my opinion, no longer a viable or sustainable in Irish agriculture. And I'm just going to quickly give you one example of this. Since 1994, it has been compulsory for all EU member states to have an environmental agri screen. This is 27 years of, of schemes ranging from initially uh, REPS1, then EOS, and currently we have GLOSS, which has been extended at the moment. But we still have cattle accessing water all over the catchment, from low stock beef part-time farmers in the, in the uplands to highly intensive dairy farmers in the lower reaches of the catchment. Granted, it's a, in a lot of situations, it is young stock, but they're still assisting the river and bank erosion continues. So uh, finally, I want to thank you all for your time and attention today. And the way I see going forward, this is a balance between the three sustainable goals of agriculture. And this is needed, this is required to grow and prosper agriculture in this country. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that might be uh, needed to be answered at the end of this session. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. That, that was a, a fascinating insight into the work that's going on there in the Mulcair EIP uh, and a really good example of partnership working uh, between statutory agencies, uh, community run initiatives uh, and, and the farming community Absolutely. as well. So th thank you, Carol, for that. Um, OK. Uh, so I'd now like to welcome Maura Walsh. Uh, Maura is the Chief Executive of IRD de Hallo, uh, which is a rural development company established in 1989. Uh, and it covers quite a large area, um, the Sleeve Latra area of East uh, Kerry, Northwest and Mid Cork uh, as well. So um, I've had the pleasure of going down to IRD de Hallo a couple of times and, and meeting Maura and the team there and the work they do is absolutely fascinating. Uh, so, Maura, I see your slides are up on the screen there now. If you want to just share your presenter view, and I'll hand over to you. Where is my last screen? Thank you very much indeed. Can everybody see? Yes, if you if you just um, click on the slide sharing function. Um, yeah, that, that, uh, uh, go, go to the top of the screen where it says display settings, Maura and click uh, just just above where the little clock is ticking. Can you see in uh, this uh, on the uh, left-hand side of your screen, there are three options and the display settings in the middle. Oh, I see the clock, yes. Yeah, click on that. This one. Yeah, and then it'll give you the option to swap presenter view and slideshow. Yeah, it, click that. Thank you. That's you me. now, that's you now. That's it's perfect. A, a, new, a new task I've learned today. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to share my presentation with people that know more and better than me while I am the overall project manager. We have two experts, Michael Morrissey, who's our ag science uh, expert, and we also have Michael O'Connor, who joined us uh, in the last year on the whole science side of the project. So we'll just split it between and hopefully people will get a better a better view. So just a quick one, um, for those of you who haven't been to IRD do hello, uh, we're based in Newmarket in County Cork. Uh, we're here for just over 30 years. Um, I think the company was founded in 1989 and we operate an integrated rural development uh, approach, um, bottom up, based in the communities. And we have four pillars or strengths to our bowls, as we say. We have social, cultural, economic and environment. And that has been our, our motto and the basis for our strategies since the mid-90s. 
So we draw on a number of um, national exchequer funded and also EU programmes to deliver across these four pillars in an integrated way that will bring social and economic growth to the region and simultaneously, of course, uh, improving the quality and of the natural environment for everybody. Um, the EIP, we were delighted to have the opportunity to apply and, of course, to have, have got the programme. But um, the reason that we were so excited about it is that it is building on the success of our leader programme in the past that had a fairly significant environment component and also on the two life programmes that we had delivered. Uh, one being Sam OK, which was the, uh, the, the, the pearl mussel and salmon and otter and kingfisher on the Aloe River, which forms part of this blue dot uh, submission. Uh, we engaged over 40 farmers in, in that life programme and they were engaged in both conservation and catchment management work. Uh, we then followed that up with a raptor life programme, which um, focused, I suppose, on more Western Dohalla, the Schlieve Lucre side, as you said, uh, looking at the Hin Harrier, but also the Salmon and Brook Lamprey and the rivers there. And again, the farmers were engaged um, very strongly in that, looking mainly, I suppose, at conservation, citizen science, and looking at specific farm measures that were, that were relevant there. And of course, in our leader programme, has engaged communities with baseline studies, environment projects, feasibility studies. Um, we do conservation work measures um, that would help biodiversity training. And also we have a big project for all the communities in Dohalo, a big planting program over the next two years, uh, communities planting for biodiversity. Um, so I'm going to just maybe hand you to Michael at this stage, Michael Morrissey, to go through the elements of the blue dot catchment. So I'll have to swing my camera around. Thanks, uh, Mara. So I'll just give a brief introduction to the project as it stands. So it's, it's a 1.4 million euro project. Um, it involves significant farmer consultation and input. So we would have consulted roughly uh, 40 farmers. So we walked 40 farms there in the summer of 2019, just as a foundation for the terms and conditions and the specs and possible measures. Um, we're engaging with the community um, to protect and restore the ecological status of the River Addo, Dado and Onanar. So we're looking at cost-effective results-based um, measures going in. Um, the project location, it's their high status objective rivers, um, a tributary of the Blackwater, which is a, a special area of conservation. Um, the project is implemented by IRD Ahello with a, um, a steering group um, of national experts. So we have, we have Tagus, Karen Daly, uh, Mary Kelly Quinn um, of UCD, Donald Daly of uh, formerly EPA, Fran Igo of Law Pro, and uh, PJ Phelan, who's an ag consultant. Um, and, and we have a representative farmer, uh, James O'Keefe, as well. Um, sorry, can you get this going here? Move on to the next slide. Mm. Sorry, we're having technical issues. Can I use this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Slide short in Yeah, just can you do it? Yeah. It's got an hour. Right, we're uh, having slight <laughs> technical <laughs> issues here. Yeah. Which one is it? Mm -hmm. This one. Okay. Now, We've received almost 100 expressions of interest for us from, for the projects. Um, so the ideally, ideally we'd want 100 farmers into the project. Um, we, we're, we're expecting more expressions of interest in, so we've re-advertised looking for farmers in particular um, areas. Um, so we've, we've 82 farm surveys conducted to map habitats, possible measures, um, hydrology on the farm. Um, our demo farms have been set up with um, several measures. So we have um, species rich grassland, farmland, ponds, um, hedgerows established, water courses fenced. Um, in the period June to September 2020, we surveyed uh, 70 farms that returned contracts. Um, they received 80,000 euros in, in uh, results based payments for implementation of, of a number of measures that have been mentioned above. Um, we've also soil sampled 18 farms um, for a sustainable nutrient management plan 
and we've trialled our self-assessment for the farm. So the farmer is going to self-assess his own nutrient management and farm, farmyard connection drain. We've a new measure introduced last year, our additional proposed works and bespoke measures. So th these include farm roadway upgrade, um, implementation of farmland biodiversity ponds, culverts and alternative drinking uh, points. We've also collaborated with Lockro on a farm road um, upgrade. So that, that work is, is almost complete, where, where we moved um, a road that was an issue, going down to a water course. Um, so we've identified uh, a number of farms for biodiversity ponds and wetlands uh, for rollout um, next year. Now, our impact, and we can see the impact on the ground from the previous Life Sam OK project. So there's a lot of the water courses will be fenced in, in, in 2010 to 2015. Uh, farmers have maintained these fence lines and created habitats um, along the water course. So the willow that would have been planted to stabilise the river bank in, in Sam OK is now being coppiced under um, this project um, and the fence lines are being maintained, resulting in, in animals not drink, drinking directly from the water course. So every, every farm received a farm visit and, and they've received multiple visits at this stage. Um, so we, we've assessed habitats, mapped out hydrology, soil type, habitat type. We've noted any uh, pressure points and we're going to be utilizing um, the EPA maps uh, with the PIP uh, zones, which are going to be very beneficial for the project uh, to identify critical source areas and flow pathways to water courses. We have ad addressed um, some issues and, and more issues to address, um, particularly around farmyards and, and uh, issues with, with uh, buffer, buffers not being adhered to and so on and so forth. Our, our nutrient management plans are, have been drawn up at this stage and they're out with the farmer. Um, the project, you know, it, it's a five-year project. We, we'd hope to get infrastructure in that will last for many, many more years. Uh, but like everything, it takes more than five years to, to get, get projects like this to, to succeed. We, every farmer has received a plan at this stage and it, it roughly looks like that, the cover sheet, and they would have received um, instructions as well how to input their, their measures. So this, this is just a basic example of the map. This is one farmer. He has roughly about 25 measures uh, completed, um, such as species risk grassland. He's put in a riparian buffer. Um, he's put in a biodiversity pond, um, 200 metre hedgerow. He's finished the, uh, a water course. Uh, he's put in a riparian, um, planted the riparian zone with, with native woodland, and he's utilised low emission story spreading. So he was he was uh, kind of the template for what we wanted, and and you know he's he's done very well for the project. Um, this is an example of of um, one of our bespoke measures. So this is a water bear to prevent silt runoff. We have three particular farms on one river um, that has that have upgraded farm roadways. There are three very different uh, jobs, and so we're monitoring those to see what the results are, and it's very positive. Um, it's it's a major we really want to roll out on a number of farms. So this is the second roadway. It was a, a bigger job. It was a high cost solution, but the farmer really showed great commitment to the EIP. We fund this this roadway probably fifty percent, so we're we're happy with it. He's in sediment pond as well after the site, which will will dual purpose provides biodiversity as well. Um, so this is a, an example of measures we think can be scaled up uh, to the to the wider catchment. So you have a natural seepage area, and like we're talking about the pit maps from the EPA will identify these as well. So we've identified all these area through uh, ground truding and, and, and surveying and walking. This, this little seepage area is now fenced off um, by the farmer. You also have a little buffer zone here um, around the tributary of the Yellow, which is a, a nice little a little river, little tributary. So the farmer has put a lot of work there into putting in a two meter buffer, and it's more than two meters, as you can see from, from the picture. So this is our little biodiversity pond from one of our demo farmers. It went in in April, 2020. In October, it had uh, progressed to a lot of vegetation. We'll, we'll, we'll expect it to be looking a lot, uh, a lot different again this year. So it is a, it, it's also a dual purpose pond again. If there's an issue with a farm roadway, it's situated in such a way that it can take uh, silt runoff, which is really what we want is a permanent in infrastructure with, with dual purpose. Um, so the farmer engagement, we, we're going to have knowledge transfer workshops, um, 
really starting in May. We're, we're obviously like everybody else, we've had issues with, with what's going on with this current situation, but we'll, we'll get over it and get on with it um, as soon as we can. So citizen science is going to play a huge role in the project. Um, smaller groups, five to ten um, farmers out in the ground doing biodiversity surveys or macro invertebrate sampling or whatnot. Um, we will be doing farm nutrient management training with the farmers and self-assessment. So at this stage, most farmers, if not all, know where the farm connection drain is on their farm. They'll be assessing that um, over the course of the next three years with a little scorecard we've provided. Um, and, and we'll be hoping to get some good results out of that. So there's our, one of our project farmers doing a bit of willow planting. Um, he's cutting the slips there to prevent, uh, put into the riverbank to prevent erosion. And this is our little macro invertebrate citizen science uh, stream index scorecard. Um, so this is uh, one thing we're going to roll out um, from May. So just to go really recap the measure of verification and payment, there's 100,000 euro verified and paid out to farmers. Um, 2021, we're, we're aiming high, we're looking at 100, 180,000 um, to, to go out this year and higher again next year. It's like every project, you know, once you get into it, you, you want to ramp up every year with, uh, with measures. We have additional farmers identified to come in, uh, particularly in, in areas where we have farmers grouped, so we can get some sort of a, a visible result um, in, in one little area if we have 10 or 15 farmers in one stretch of river in a little pocket. Um, so the objectives of the project, we're maintaining and enhancing the blue dot water quality, hoping to reduce greenhouse gases and increase biodiversity on farmland. Um, we're hoping to improve the awareness of of um, and the importance of high status um, water quality. The farmers, through a, a survey we've done, have some awareness of it. You know, we, we want to get more awareness out there of how important these waters are um, to, to, to this catchment and, and other catchments. So the role that agriculture and farming plays, you know, it's, it's an ecosystem service, um, it's public goods. Farmers are getting paid for production, you know, they need to get, rewarded for an ecosystem service and, and, and you know, beneficial environmental outcomes as well. So we, we hope to put these measures in. We want them to stand the test of time. It's not a case of getting them in for the sake of it for a couple of years. We want uh, green infrastructure, permanent infrastructure in, um, so farmers can um, have these for a number of years going forward. So that's a species rich grassland and that's my part and I'll pass over to the project scientist Michael Ockham. Uh, hi guys, uh, so our survey uh, season is beginning soon, um, so obviously Juhalo Farming for Blue Dot catchments, we will, um, we have a lot of emphasis on water quality, so we're planning on doing a macro invertebrate kick sample on each of our farms, uh, you can see there in the top right corner a little salmon parda found his way into a kick net, he's obviously not a macro invertebrate but still a good uh, indicator nonetheless. Um, we're also going to be doing chemical tests um, on a number of locations around the catchment uh, just to gather some baseline data um, of water quality in the catchment that we can compare year on year. Um, so obviously birds are uh, rapidly declining on, on a farmland, something we're very cautious of. So um, we will be monitoring bird uh, populations through some of our measures. And you can see there on the right, we have a San Martin colony and I suppose the San Martins will be arriving back from Africa there in the coming week or so. So that's something we'll be uh, keeping an eye on closely. Um, but also we'll be conducting a lion transit surveys uh, on project farms just to get a, an understanding of the abundance and diversity of bird species on, on project farms. So then vegetation um, monitoring, we'll be monitoring vegetation through measures, uh, the likes of wet grassland, species rich grassland. But also through uh, some of the ponds and Michael mentioned there that, you know, our pond will look different again in the summer, the ponds that, ponds that were put in last summer. So that's something we'll be, we'll be surveying. Um, and we also have funding from the Community Foundation of Ireland for um, some more extensive biodiversity uh, surveys um, with uh, an emphasis on uh, assessing the condition and extent of hedgerows. And I, I'll come back to that. Um, so strategic partnerships are a big part of the project as well. Um, and we aim to form a number of fruitful synergies with uh, the likes of academia, uh, other community groups, um, with industry and so on and so forth. 
Um, I suppose we're lucky at IRD that we that we have a number of other environmental projects going on in the background that add value um, to our existing measures, but they also increase the project uh, learnings, increase the reach of the project learnings. Uh, so to start there with LEADER, uh, in the summer we're going to have a, a barn owl monitoring project. Um, we're working alongside Birdwatch Ireland for that and I suppose in the last few weeks we've had a lot of interest from both the community and from farmers in barn owls and this project. So it's trying to get the community involved in conservation through the use of this uh, universally loved species, the barn owl. And as a part of that, we'll also be, well, Birdwatch Ireland will be conducting um, a rodenticide use survey amongst farmers and some of our farmers in the project will be participating in that. That'll be the first of its kind in Ireland and it was very important really uh, to get a better understanding of farmer perceptions of rodenticides and the impact on biodiversity. And below that then we have communities planting for biodiversity, so we'll be working alongside Ian McGregor from Gortbrack Farm. Uh, Ian has already done some community audits um, aiming to identify, uh, I suppose, potential conservation measures that can be put in place within communities. Um, and then again, a similar project, the community water biodiversity training with Cork Nature Network and Law Pro. Um, and this, uh, I suppose, is on trying to get the community involved in the conservation of their local rivers. Um, and I suppose a big part of this project would be citizen science and using citizen science to monitor water quality in the catchment and of course that would be very useful for us to gather usable baseline data as well. Um, and then finally we have an anaerobic digester feasibility study. So this was a, a key aim of the project from the get-go was to investigate the potential of anaerobic digesters and we're working, this is co-funded by Gas Networks Ireland and I suppose it's important for the project because it's potentially something we could pay farmers for, it could be a measure where farmers could um, potentially be paid to supply slurry to an AD hub. You have um, one minute left for the presentation. Okay, yeah, I'll try and keep it quick. So we're, obviously we do a lot of work with Law Pro as well. We have two projects there in particular, the Silt Traps project. Um, we have uh, Silt Traps placed in three different drains of varying gradient in vegetation. And um, we have been taking suspended solid tests and in train sediment tests. And so far they've been very successful. Another farm roadway project um, to try, it's, it's basically taking, cutting the pathway of a direct, of a source of nutrient sediment uh, from a farm way into a river. And uh, I mentioned there about the Community Foundation of Ireland as well. So we'll be um, conducting some biodiversity surveys and yeah, with farmers from lowly stock to high stock for farmers. And uh, I suppose the outcome of that will be um, biodiversity plans and hedgerow maps. And just to say a quick bit there about uh, some of our achievements. So we won uh, the Sustainable or sustainable Agriculture Award from Cork Environmental Forum in December. That was uh, following on from the success of the Raptor Life, you know, uh, previous project we had here as well, also won that in 2015. And yes, yeah, so that's, thanks very much guys. I hope I didn't go over the time. Well done. You did very well there to wrap it up. Thank you very much for that. That was a really fascinating insight into the work that um, IRD de Hallo are doing on the Allo River and the rivers around that particular area. So thank you to Maura and the team for that. Um, so last but not least, I'd like to welcome uh, Owen Kinsella, uh, who works with Wexford Kent Council as an agricultural scientist, but he's also the project manager on the Duncannon Blue Flag Farming and Community Scheme EIP project. So Owen, um, if you have your slides up, which you do, uh, and screen share for us. Uh, sorry, share your slides as present presentation for you. That's it. Uh, have your microphone on? Apologies, yeah. Yeah, I've got you now. That's great, Owen. It's over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, you. Yeah, that's yeah, you now. Perfect. Go on ahead. Thanks very much, Mark. Thanks to Catherine and all those who organised this um, conference. I know it's a virtual conference and um, I'm sure we'd how and ever we have to live with what's in front of us. Um, Mark's already introduced me, I'm Okinstein project manager with the Duncannon Blue Flag Farming and Community Scheme, it's an EIP project. It's a locally, a, a local authority, Wexford local authority led project as well. Um, 
one of a kind, I suppose, um, within Ireland. Um, just on today, I just wanted to talk why um, bring you down to, I suppose, Duncanon Beach, the history behind the EIP project, where we are to date, and also kind of what's going to go forward. So Duncanon Beach, um, it's as well as, I suppose, it's probably the most important beach in Southwest Wexford. Um, unfortunately, being part of a designated bathing water and shellfish water area, um, it forms part of the River Barrow and Noor SAC, um, at, attracting tourists, four to five thousand tourists every day, like you know, on a warm summer's day, the beach does. Um, unfortunately, in 2007, um, the beach lost its blue flag, and we're pushing on now, like you know, without a blue flag. Um, we have seen. I suppose, a trend, a downward trend in the economy and local tourists as well. Um, I suppose, unlike some other EIP projects, we have uh, a good few pressures in Duncan Beach, um, forming part of the Waterford Harbour Estuary. Um, we have upstream pressures um, flowing right by Duncan Beach. Um, we also have pressures coming from the village of Duncan Beach through surface water. Um, one of the main pressures as well is what the EIP project will look at um, are the two rivers that flow on to Duncannon Beach, um, the Curragh Moor stream and the small stream as well, it's locally known as. The fourth and final pressure, unfortunately, um, Duncannon, Ballyhack and Arthurstown has, have no sewerage treatment facility, um, so discharges from each of the piers locally. Now, um, we only got word last week that Irish Water have announced um, six contractors um, and hopefully that project will get going. It's a 12 and a half million euro project um, due to be completed in the next 18 months. So it will be a major help. Um, why we looked at the EIP project, I suppose investigations prior to me arriving, um, I suppose our environment section looked at Duncannon as a catchment and the revealed farmyards of 16 inspections through its three direct discharges. But not only that, domestic wastewater, your septic tank, your treatment plants, there was 40 septic tank inspections. 16 of those failed where six were, were directly discharged into the water course. So there's limitations to these inspections. Um, the very top down very, um, management is not addressed on a daily basis. And as Donald from the bride, like, you know, there was a lot of finger pointing going on down there. So, um, but people weren't aware that we were dealing with multiple pressures. Um, just in those pictures, you can see the various pressures, um, die testing there from septic tanks, and then you had drinking points, yards not fully closed off as well. So this gave us the opportunity to um, apply for the EIP. Um, it was a new source of funding of 59 million. Um, we're very I suppose we're very lucky to have the locally led section, um, a seven minute drive away from Wexford County Council offices. It just gave us an opportunity, the farmers an opportunity in the community, um, the opportunity to, to drive on with a locally led scheme to improve water quality and also protecting farm incomes. Um, we were part of round one, 12 successful projects and we'd receive funding of 550,000 for a three year project. Um, I suppose the two people behind us, mainly Dr. Mairead Shore, she's with Law Pro now at the moment. Um, she was probably the author behind this, as well as private advisor there, Con Curtin, based in Kilkenny. So the main aims of the Duncanon EIP, um, obviously, look at, we really need to restore, protect and enhance the water quality, not just the streams, but also upstream of Duncanon <laughs> Beach as well. Um, and there's quite a lot of people, um, quite a lot of other counties involved in this in this um, stream and water course. Developing an effective model for future catchments, this won't be the last um, model EIP project um, going down the line. Like, you know, we'd, like, we'd love to see another one in Wexford as well. Um, other local authorities should really focus their attention as well on this um, and fostering them pos that positive relationship between farmers and households. Our catchment area, that's just, um, snapshot there off Google Maps. Um, that's just a 13, three and a half thousand acre catchment. Um, within that catchment are 66 landowners. There's over 220 houses. Um, we also have the village of Rams Grange, a thriving rural village, um, a community school, a private, uh, a primary school, 
as well as the daycare centre, your shop, your post office, that type of thing. Unfortunately, Ramsgrange Village doesn't have any communal um, wastewater treatment system as well. So there are pressures there, um, human influences, I suppose, um, we are seeing. We deal with a very lot of, um, I suppose, free draining soils. However, there are areas within the catchment that are very poorly draining, leading to elevated nitrates and phosphorus um, impact on ecology as well. Um, we do get on get in um, Aquins Limited um, once a year to assess the ecology um, within the catchment. So I suppose our approach was creating what we call a pollution potential zone plan for each map um, by providing farmers with a full-time advisor, myself, um, and also the, their own advisors come on board. Um, not just monitoring water quality in the catchment, but monitoring farm practice, farm management change as well and creating the local awareness program for the domestic wastewater treatment systems. Our environment technicians carry out between 40 and 50 safety tank inspections each year, not just within the catchment, but outside it as well. So it gives us a good run of the wider community. And then just developing community-wide engagement, just getting people to have that kind of, that local ownership, and a little bit more responsibility, appreciate their local environment. So our, this is how we approach it. Um, we go onto a farm, we carry out a survey, um, we develop the maps then as well, and then we're able to give that farmer a water protection payment as well as the funded works. So our water protection payments are based on both risk and the number of PPZs, that is, the pollution potential, they're graded, um, and then the result as well, um, the overall farm level. So that's just our payment structure. Um, a lot of farmers in the first year probably um, fell into the yellow and the red. Um, there was a few minor non-compliances on farms um, that were all picked up. But um, we're very happy with the progress to date um, where farmers are and some of them have got up to the green status as well. We also provide a grant system for um, various different actions. Um, this is just one that I just um, tallied up there earlier on this week. Um, a farmer wanted to fence their water courses, 300 metres, put in the water truck, the quarter inch pipe, and lays a base co total cost of 1,060 euros. We give them that farmer back a 50% grant, so it's 530. Plus their time is on top of this as well, so they're 100% um, grant aided for their time. So today, our application began in May 2019. Um, we have 36 farmers out of 41. That has probably our biggest win to date. Um, just the, the buy-in from the farmers, um, totaling about 960 hectares. Um, 23 out of 36 of those farmers are in Gloss, the current Gloss, actually well extended now at this stage. Um, and 28, we have more than 28 farmers with nutrient management plans. So some of the works we're looking at, I suppose, take you to the first picture, the green cover, we're really pushing farmers, not just in Gloss, but outside Gloss, tillage farmers, to plant more green cover um, throughout the winter. Um, we've fenced an additional four and a half kilometers of water course, um, bringing it to a total 100% of land now is fenced um, in the catchment that has access um, by, vo by bovines. Um, that, that's fields, just fields that have access to bovines. Um, we've moved in the region of about 50 to 60 water trucks to better locations. Um, there is a drive. I know derogation farmers are obliged now to spread all their slurry um, by low emission slurry spreading, but there is a drive there to get these farmers that have these spreaders um, to contract, um, get, get contracting on slurry spreading to other farmers. Sediment loss is a major issue in the catchment as well. That's just a knee high deep um, picture of a winter crop. So that farmer has decided to plant a six meter arable grass margin at the bottom of that field there. And then basically um, just by providing a spring crop only field um, into that field. Willow plantation is something that we're going to look at in 2021, as well as um, establishing hedgerow um, going forward as well in more vulnerable areas. So our operational group is quite a large operational group. Um, it's Wexford County Council led. Also involved there is Chagas Advisory and Research. We have a local farmer who is an IFA rep. Um, as well as that, then we have Board Bia and Glan Bia from a sustainability point of view. And I suppose the 
probably the, the biggest um, would be the advisory service, not just Chagas Advisory. We also have Jeff Barry Agricultural Consultants involved. Our water quality monitoring across the three and a half thousand acre catchment, uh, 12 different sites. I usually pick an extra three sites just on the morning, um, just random snapshots um, to see. Um, we sample about six times a year in the catchment. Um, we do many look at stormwater flow as well. And as I mentioned, um, Dr. Ian Robert Bars from Aquins Limited comes down once a year to do the ecology assessment. Um, we are seeing an improvement um, in Q values when it does come to the ecology side of things. Um, high nitrates is still an issue in, this, in, in the catchment, but bacteria levels are starting to fall now as well. One, I don't want to touch on this. Um, I suppose, as Mary Kelly Quinn is going to be talking about citizen science, but this was just something that was carried out in 2017. Um, um, two citizen science courses um, funded through the flags um, basically were held in Duncanon, not just for the farmers, but anybody that wanted to get involved. Um, Ken Whelan showed the participants then how to monitor the water quality of their local streams. And basically it just, they looked at identifying scoring the invertebrates. Um, as I said, there was huge interest. Farmers still talk to me about it today. That's a, the centre picture is a farmer there himself, dairy farmer in derogation. And he still talks about participating in that and he'd love to get down there again, like, you know, and, and do that course. So I suppose just going forward, um, like the encouragement to farm participation in, in any initiative is, is a definite. Um, there's many different talks going out there, not just Chagas, but Glambia, Bordbia. So we really need to push on um, with getting, like encouraging farm participation in that. Farmer, farm demonstrations, obvious enough, look at 2019 was a year that we really got involved with the farmers. Um, unfortunately, since 2020, March 2020, we haven't really had many face-to-face um, -face contacts. Expert talks, agriculture, our biggest one to date would be Catchment Science 2019, which was held by the Agricultural Catchments Program. Um, we basically held a field trip to the catchment um, it was part of Catchment Science 2019 and look at there was people from America, Germany, England further afield um, and it was great to see them having an interest in what we're trying to do as well. Um, developing that system of communicating of the water quality results, we are hoping to form a Blue Flags Community Committee. Unfortunately we haven't had any meetings to date with the community um, and it more than likely will be done by Zoom as well. Text alert system has been set up for farmers um, for heavy rainfall, various different um, measures um, that can be done, um, not just weather, I suppose, as well. Like, you know, there's different, I suppose, special offers from various different um, outlets kind of in the catchment and that type of thing. Maintain citizen science courses. Look, I suppose, again, like it's something that we're going to have to look at maybe from the Blue Flags Committee. Um, the domestic wastewater treatment system campaign will continue. Um, we are, we will, as soon as level five um, draws to a close, hopefully we will get back out there and carry out septic tank inspe inspections. Fishing competitions and kick sampling um, is something that we will be looking at also with the primary side of things. We engaged with Coastwatch earlier on um, last year and we got a group of students um, leaving sort of play students down to the beach and we done the coast watch survey it was great look at we split them up into three groups um they just got out for some fresh air i suppose as well um and on the social media side of things then we are on twitter website and um, we have our website and we have the facebook page up and running as well great engagement there as well oh, this is just something have, i came oh, across yeah. uh, oh we only have yeah, one minute left slides. okay Perfect. thank you all this is just something I came across there the other day. Um, this was a, I suppose, what I'd call a sediment trap anyway. I definitely, we don't, we call, talk about man-made. It was a family, a family-made sediment trap, um, a, a local landowner, um, I suppose, just getting the kids out, the dogs out. And after contacting the farmer, it's not the first one, it was the second one they have actually built. And you can just see how the sediment trap is actually working. Um, the clearer water on the side of things and we talk about cost effective 
simple ideas. You couldn't get any more cost effective and more simpler than that. Um, so I suppose what's expected, um, definitely compliance above nitrates directive. Um, we are, we're, we're very close to compliance on all farms now, um, the last probably three or four. Um, when you have compliance on farms, you have more efficient farms as well. Um, we want to see a reduction in septic tank failures, um, as well as a reduction in bacteria pollution and then improving ecological status. And again, that local ownership, the responsibility and the appreciation for the local environment. That's me. Thanks very much, everybody. Again, just thanks to Mark. Thanks to Catherine, the organizers. Um, feel free to follow us on Twitter or Facebook. Um, my contact details are there.